Okay, everybody, let's get to work. Um, big surprise, right? A week from today, second exam for this class. So as I said on Tuesday, it's going to look a lot like the one in the back of the lecture notes. Um, 45 multiple choice questions. Bring a number two pencil. Uh, you'll need it to fill in those Scantron forms. Uh, I'm thinking we will not ask you to show your ID this time just because of logistical issues that we discovered the last time, the line of people waiting to turn things in. But this time, I want to really encourage you to be careful to record the form of the exam that you have, right? A1, B2, that sort of thing. On the last test, I think you guys all will remember, there were four different colors to the exam. There were actually two different versions of the exam, but there was only one answer key for the whole exam. So regardless of what version you had, the sequence of the right answers was the same. For this test coming up next Thursday, a week from today, what I'm going to try to do is have four different exams on one color, all with different answer keys. So we'll need to know which uh, which form you had in order to grade it with the right answer key. So just while I have your attention now, please write down the form of the exam that you have. Uh, about this test, right, um, I'm going to only ask you things that I talked about during the course of the class. So if for some reason I run out of time on Tuesday and I don't finish going through the lecture that I should be talking with you about, I'm not going to ask you questions about those things. More likely on Tuesday is I'm going to have about 10, 15 minutes to play with. Um, and what I'd like to do is at the end of the class on Tuesday, give you guys a chance to ask me some questions. Right? So if you want to leave, feel free to leave early on Tuesday. But if you want to stick around and have sort of a mini review session, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, if I have a chance, I'll put together just the outlines of the, the lectures and I'll run through those quickly at the end of the class just so you can refresh your memory about what this test is going to be about. Um, between now and the next time that I see you, I'm going to be uh, in San Francisco and back. And so I'm going to be traveling a fair bit over the next two or three days. but. Uh, I should have pretty good e email access, and if you need to reach me, uh, feel free to send me an email. That'll be your best chance to get a hold of me to ask me a question. Uh, I think I may be having some issues with my office hours on Monday. So if you really were looking to see me on Monday, maybe we should try to arrange a time other than that 9.30 till 10.30 slot that I usually set aside for office hours. I should have opportunities to meet with you in the afternoon on Monday or also before class on Tuesday during my office hours. So anyway, a bunch of little trivial things, things that most of you will probably not worry too much about. Okay, so that's where I wanted to start. Just a reminder about this test coming up. But today, just gets better and better, guys. I tell you, if you thought that I was animated and excited in class on uh, Tuesday when I was talking with you about cell reproduction. Wow, man, you know, that's just because I got to talk about DNA a little bit. Just a couple times I got to talk about chromosomes, and that, that makes my day. Today, we're talking not just about chromosomes, but we're getting into the beginnings of genetics. I'm a molecular geneticist. That's sort of what my job is. That's what I'm trained to know and to do. And so we're talking about stuff that's near and dear to my heart. And I think, uh, I hope that my enthusiasm for these things don't overwhelm you or doesn't overwhelm you during the course of today's lecture. But so for the last class on Tuesday, I talked with you about mitosis. In a nutshell, that's the process by which you go from having one eukaryotic cell to having two eukaryotic cells. The big hurdle to accomplishing that, the thing that really needs to be done that's hard, is you need to replicate the nucleus. Everything else is relatively trivial to that business of nuclear replication. And in a word, the process by which a eukaryotic nucleus gets duplicated is mitosis. Okay? You could think of mitosis as, essentially, as a sort of asexual reproduction. It's a means by which cells are just propagating themselves. Today, we're going to 
use that as a foundation, but now move into the realm of sexual reproduction. And at the end of the lecture, you can see there's something that we'll have a lot of fun talking about. I'm sure it turns out that there are some uh, significant, really remarkable advantages associated with actually having sex. All right? So we can talk, we can explore it in a number of different ways. I'm going to try to focus on the genetic aspects of the advantages of having sex. But we'll see, you know, this one's, you know, of all the lectures that I do for this class, this one's probably the most R-rated. So just, just a word, brace yourself, it's gonna get a little blue uh, in just a minute. So that's what's going on today. I wanna talk with you about sexual reproduction. The problem that mitosis solves is going from having one nucleus to a pair of nuclei. The problem that meiosis solves, sounds similar, spelled similar, different though, the problem that meiosis solves is going from a nucleus, which has got diploid chromosomes in it, two copies of all of our chromosomes, to gametes that have just one copy, right? The path that you take to solve that problem, reducing the haploid number, is a rooted pretty clearly in the path that you take to replicating a nucleus, but there are some interesting and important differences, and of course that's what we'll be focusing on. All right, so before we really get into talking about making gametes, let me just refresh your memory a little bit about ploidy. I told you, didn't I, that it's gonna get R-rated real fast, right? This is an image from your textbook, so I figure it can't be too big of a problem, but there are naked people there. That's the first time that that's happened. Uh, in this class so far. Uh, check it out. You know, I know what you guys are all looking at, but you know, look at the whole picture because what's happening here is this is meant to illustrate to you that uh, we, we as human beings live most of our lives as diploid organisms. Again, that's something I talked with you about on Tuesday. Simply, we have two copies of all of our chromosomes, okay? We have 23 different chromosomes. We got two copies of each. You can quibble about the sex chromosomes if you like, but let's just be friends here and say we've got 23 different chromosomes, two copies of each, a total of 46 chromosomes inside of each of our cells, okay? And we live again most of our lives as a diploid organism, and we're thinking diploid organisms, and we think of ourselves as that's all that really matters. From a evolutionary perspective, from a biological perspective, certainly from a genetics perspective, all that we think of that's so swell and cool about ourselves is just window dressing. It's just a big set of wrapping and tissue paper that's a vehicle by which our ovaries and testes can move around and do what they need to accomplish. And what they need to accomplish is ultimately producing gametes and getting those gametes hooked up with other gametes so that you can have the whole process happen again. Those gametes are not diploid, they have to be haploid. So human beings essentially cycle through a period where we're diploid and then a period where we're haploid and we go back to diploid and haploid. Practically speaking, most of our lives are spent in the diploid phase, little tiny time when we're haploid, okay? But that's not always the case for other organisms. Different organisms have evolved different strategies. So here's a mouse, not that different from us, but for some organisms, like some plants and some algae, there's kind of a 50-50 split where what you see living out in the world is more likely to be the haploid gamut than it is the diploid organism. So the way that the, the, the apportionment of time to these different um, uh, parts of our lives, diploid versus diploid versus haploid, can differ strategically from one organism to another. And for an awful lot of fungi, the sorts of things, the mushrooms and such that you eat, what you're eating are actually haploid cells in the diploid zygotes are you know, the spores that most people don't pay any attention to. So again, uh, just be mindful of the fact that for us, we tend to spend most of our time as diploids and only a little bit of time as gametes that are haploids, but that's not necessarily a rule that has to be followed. All right, so some terminology for you here. 
gametes are haploid. When you're talking about the, the number of chromosomes that an organism has, we're going to be referring to that as n. Right? So n is the total number of chromosomes. For fruit flies, n is 4. There are four different chromosomes. For human beings, n is 23. For E. coli, n is 1. It's one big circular chromosome. So m is n is simply the number of chromosomes. A haploid organism is just n. A diploid organism is 2n. I mentioned to you on Tuesday this idea that prior to cell division, after nuclear replication, well, just before cytokinesis and at the end of cell division, our cells are tetraploid. Right? We have two copies of both sets of our chromosomes. So that's a total of four. So at those points in time, human cells are 4N, or tetraploid. All right? And so when we're talking about the haploid cells, those are referred to as gametes. And when we're talking about the diploid cells, that, at least for animals, or when we're talking about having a multicellular organism, when the gametes come together, they create a new diploid cell that we call a zygote. And the zygote, through multiple series of mitosis, ends up developing into a multicellular organism. All right? So I think this is pretty basic stuff, things that you've probably encountered many times before. Uh, again, the strategy can differ from one type of organism to another. Here's where it's most dramatic. You can see that for fungi, some protists, that what's actually going on is that the haploid cells are undergoing mitosis. Right? So we don't see that happening with our gametes. There's no mitosis here. The only time mitosis kicks in is for the diploid organisms. But for fungi, mitosis is actually replicating these gametes. And we don't do mitosis for the uh, diploid zygotes. So again, different strategies uh, have been adopted by different organisms. And we see these different patterns in life cycles. All right, so enough said. I think the main point here is simply this. Keep your eye on the, the number of sets of chromosomes. That'll help you as we go through the next sets of slides. So N, 2N, and in some instances, we'll be talking about 4N. But let's get to work talking about meiosis and what it is that needs to happen. A little more jargon for you. This slide is just here to help me remember to tell you about a couple of different terms. A, uh, here are the, I don't know what organism this is, but here the haploid number is three. Right? So we only have three different chromosomes here. You can see there's a big blue one, a medium blue one, and a little blue one. And the same would be true for the red ones. And these chromosomes can be thought of as coming from two different parents, right? Because this is a diploid organism. Two, two haploid gametes came together. One of those sets of haploid gam gametes came from what we're going to call a male, the paternal set of chromosomes. And the others, the red ones here, are coming from the other parent, their maternal chromosomes. Again, I don't think I'm telling you anything revolutionary or new here. But if the male has three chromosomes, the females should have three chromosomes, and they should be roughly equivalent to each other, right? You got a big blue and you got a big red. The genes on the big blue should be similar, if not the same, as the genes on the big red, right? These similar chromosomes are called uh, homologous chromosomes, OK? So equivalent chromosomes. And I'll tell you another little trick that's not on this slide here. You know how chromosomes get their names? It's based on their size. So we've got chromosomes 1 through 22 within our cells, and then the sex chromosomes, X and Y. Guess what we call the biggest of our chromosomes? It's chromosome 1. Guess what's the next biggest? Chromosome 2, right? And so on. So the bigger the chromosome, the smaller the number. And so I may just, uh, for shorthand and convenience here, might start talking about, well, here, check out chromosome 1 and as opposed to chromosome 2 or as opposed to chromosome 3. Again, it's the convention is you name the chromosomes based on their size. 
notice we're going to be also talking about this idea of sister chromatids. A chromatid is just a chromosome, okay? And so chromatid and chromosome are roughly interchangeable terms. In meiosis, we're also going to be talking about how these chromosomes, after they get replicated, unlike in mitosis, but in meiosis, they stay stuck together. So we started with one chromosome one in blue, but it got replicated, and now we can start talking about two sister chromatids, two copies of that chromosome one. And where they get held together is a constriction you can see with a microscope. Uh, those constrictions are called centromeres. Okay? So again, some more jargon for you. All right. So in mitosis, what would happen is you would replicate those chromosomes, get the sister chromatids next to each other. That's not that different from what would happen during meiosis. Well, so we'll get into meiosis here. And what happens with meiosis is there's going to be a round of cell division where we get uh, the paternal chromosomes over here and the maternal chromosomes over here in this instance, and then ultimately we're going to end up with another round of cell division without DNA replication, and now we end up with four haploid gametes where we started out with one diploid cell. Right. So for meiosis, this is the bottom line. This is the overview from whatever, 20, 30,000 feet. You start out with a diploid cell. The diploid cell undergoes a round of DNA replication, so the synthesis part of, uh, of the, the, the interphase. That DNA replication takes you from having a diploid cell to having a tetraploid cell. The tetraploid cell undergoes a round of cell division cytokinesis, right? We separate the, the chromosomes into the two new cells. And then we have one more round of cell division, but this time there is no DNA replication. So that's a departure from what we would have seen in a mitotic type of cell division. That's what, one of the things that makes this stand out is meiosis. What will happen is you start with a diploid cell, for a little while, you'll be tetraploid. There will be a round of cell division to give you more diploid cells, and then those two diploid cells will each give rise to two haploid gametes. If you're a male, we call those gametes sperm. If you're a female, we call those gametes eggs. Okay. So if that was at 20,000 feet, this is probably more like 40,000 feet, but there's a whole lot of other stuff going on. The next couple slides that I'm going to show you will hone in on little segments of what's going on here for the whole process of meiosis. But if you kind of squint your eyes, what you can see is pretty much what we had just seen on that previous slide. We're starting out here with a tetraploid cell, so the diploid cell that already replicated its DNA. We go through what looks an awful lot like mitosis to get two diploid cells, and then without another, without any pause, you go straight back into another round of nuclear division, and you end up with a total of four haploid gametes. So, there's an awful lot of parallels with mitosis. A lot of the names are the same as what was going on in mitosis, but let's start talking about meiosis, okay? There's essentially two mitoses that happen to give you a meiosis. And it becomes convenient then, and it's convention, to talk about the first mitosis of sorts and the second mitosis of sorts. And you'll see what's, what I mean by that by the fact that you start with, uh, what, how do you start mitosis? You start mitosis with the business of prophase. How do you start meiosis? You start meiosis with prophase, but there's essentially going to be two prophases. So we have a prophase one, and later on you'll see a prophase two. We have a metaphase one. Later on there's a metaphase two. There's an anaphase one, a telophase one. There's also an anaphase two in a telophase two. So what happens during telophase, just plain old telophase? What happens in telophase is the chromosomes need to condense. 
right? So they're less entangled. The nuclear envelope needs to dissipate. You need to lose that nuclear envelope. And centrioles need to move to the opposite sides of the cell, okay? That is mitosis telophase. I'm sorry, that's mitosis prophase. It's also meiosis prophase. You've got the same problems, the same solution to those problems. Condense the chromosomes, get rid of the nuclear envelope, move the centrioles to the opposite sides of the cell. So prophase one in meiosis and prophase in mitosis are exactly the same in those regards, in regard to solving that biggest problem. There is a difference in prophase one rel of meiosis relative to prophase of mitosis. In prophase one of meiosis, what happens is the sister chromatids remain attached. They line up and they segregate with each other and they remain attached to each other and interact in an interesting way. I think it's a little while before I show you this picture, but this is one of the coolest parts of meiosis. Let me tell you this. Prophase one in meiosis takes longer than the rest of meiosis combined. All the rest of meiosis happens in a flash compared to prophase one of meiosis. Prophase one of meiosis takes a whole lot longer than prophase in mitosis. The difference, why it takes so long, is because of a phenomenon called crossing over that happens with the chromosomes during prophase one of meiosis. The only time that crossing over occurs is during prophase one of meiosis. It never happens during mitosis. It only happens during meiosis, and specifically it only happens during prophase one. Crossing over turns out to be a big deal. Crossing over is referring to this business of swapping roughly equivalent parts of a maternal chromosome for the paternal chromosome's counterpart, okay? So, got a maternal chromosome one and a maternal chromosome two during prophase one of meiosis, you can swap a chunk of the paternal chromosome one and exchange it for the equivalent part of the maternal chromosome one, right? That's what's going on during crossing over. The way that crossing over actually takes place is the chromosomes during prophase one, the homologous chromosomes line up next to each other, right? Gene one next to gene one, gene 16 next to gene 16, on down the line, all of them line up next to each other. And at certain points along the chromosome, randomly, randomly crossing over will occur at locations that you can actually see with a light microscope, where you can see the chromosomes or the, the homologous chromatids are physically overlapping with each other. Crossing over occurs at things you can see in a light microscope that you call a chiasma, right? Chi is the Greek letter that looks like our letter X, right? And that crossing over looks a lot like an X in a light microscope, and hence the name chiasma, okay? And what takes so long in prophase one, why it is prophase one takes so long compared to everything else, is it takes a long time to get those chromosomes lined up so that the equivalent parts are next to each other, but what really takes a long time is the assemblage of the proteins at those crossing over points, at those chiasma, that get the job done of breaking the maternal chromosome and the paternal chromosome at the equivalent spots and then fusing those ends back together again to make whole chromosomes when it's all done. There's a big complex of proteins that clusters at those chiasma. And I'm, I want to dump this on you in a way that really blows you away because to me this is one of the coolest words that we encounter in all of uh, genetics and all of biology. I've given you some really good ones, right? Reticuloendothelial system is high on my list of favorites. Uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, you know, that's some good enzyme names. Brace yourself for a real good one. 
the, the complex of proteins at the chiasma where crossing over is occurring, ready? It's a synaptonemal complex. All right, so there's a real good one for you. But that's that the, the assemblage of that synaptonemal complex, I'll show you the spelling of it in a little bit. The assemblage of that synaptonemal complex is what takes a lot of time in prophase one. The only time those proteins are around, the only time those proteins do their thing is prophase one of meiosis. You can't do this crossing over during mitosis. It only happens during meiosis. That's equivalent to my saying it only happens during sexual reproduction. Okay? So here's what's going to happen. You've got these chias uh, chiasmata where the crossing over is occurring at those junctions is where a synaptonemal complex will be. Prophase one involves this condensing of the chromosomes, the aligning of the homologous chromatids, crossing over, and then all the rest that you expect to have happen for prophase, the loss of the nuclear envelope and the movement of the centrioles. In time, as prophase progresses, as prophase one progresses here, the mitotic spindle is going to form. Here we'll call it a meiotic spindle, but it's the same mechanism that we had talked about before. And eventually, you reach a point in time when the synaptonemal complexes have gone away, the chiasma has been resolved, the chromosomes are as condensed as they can be, they're lined up on a single plane in the middle of the cell, excuse me, the uh, centrioles are on opposite sides of the cell, we call that metaphase. Right? In meiosis, it's just plain old metaphase. In meiosis, here, we're going to call it metaphase one. Okay? So an awful lot is the same for metaphase one that would, you would have seen for plain old metaphase in mitosis. Then something interesting happens as well, a little bit different than what happens in mitosis. We get into anaphase, right? so the sequence of events is still the same. Uh, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, ultimately telophase. The sequence is the same. I'll tell you the difference at the end. We'll start with the things that are similar. Anaphase one of meiosis and anaphase of mitosis, what do you got to do? You got to get those chromosomes segregated. That's the fancy word for it. Get them to opposite sides of the cell. You do that by shortening here the meiotic spindle. Okay, those tubules are, that are anchored to the centrioles and attached to the centromeres of the chromosomes. Those shorten and pull the chromosomes apart. And a nuclear envelope starts to form again. Okay, so that's the same in meiosis as it is in mitosis. Oh, and the chromosomes start to get more spindly again. All right, so the same in meiosis as it is in mitosis, but here's the difference. In anaphase one, notice that the sister chromatids are still connected to each other at their centromeres. In mitosis, after metaphase, those chromosomes become separated. The centromeres are no longer going to hold the sister chromatids together, and they get pulled across independently. But here for anaphase one, they're still attached. After anaphase is over, you just continue with this progression. The chromosomes become more spindly. The nuclear envelope becomes more back in shape the way it was before the whole process started. The mitotic, now the meiotic spindle is pretty much gone. Pretty much all the rest plays out just as it would in mitosis. Here, though, we call it telophase, and specifically we call it telophase one. And you're going to have cytokinesis with that cleavage furrow that splits the two cells in half. And you started with a single tetraploid cell, and you're ending up now with two diploid cells. Here's a closer look at all the things that I've just been talking with you about. I'm feeling fairly droning and monotonous right now. I should have had some caffeine this morning. Uh, I'm just going to zip through this because I think I've already told you what it is I wanted to really mention to you. It's just a closer view. So if you want, you can zoom in on these pictures on the slides that are available on the pilot page for the course. But I'm not seeing anything different here than what we just talked about. So let me get back to where we ended. All right. 
here's the whole bit of meiosis, the first part of meiosis, meiosis one. We end it with a pair of soon to be deployed cells. <clears throat> right? Got that cleavage furrow. Let the cleavage furrow do its thing. Check it out. There's a path going there. There's a fork in the road that goes there. <clears throat> Here's where those forks in the road play out. Now we can start talking about what happens in meiosis two, the second half of meiosis. If we were talking about mitosis, what would happen now is you would enter into interphase. <clears throat> and before you would begin another round of mitosis, part of that interphase you'd have to pass through the S phase where you synthesize, specifically where you replicate DNA. That's not going to happen in meiosis. In meiosis, you do that, you, you start with your tetraploid cell, you end up with two diploid cells, and then you go immediately to another round of cell division, proceed directly to go, bypass everything along the way, specifically, and most importantly, don't replicate the DNA again. Don't do another S phase, okay? And instead, at the end of meiosis one, you started with a tetraploid cell, you now have two diploid cells. Those two diploid cells both immediately go through another round of nuclear division. We're gonna call that meiosis two, okay? But there is no more DNA replication between meiosis one and meiosis two. And in meiosis two, you start with nothing other than prophase two. What do you do during prophase two? What do you do during any prophase? Well, the chromosomes get condensed. The nuclear envelope starts to go away, and centrioles move to the opposite side of the cell. Now notice, the DNA didn't replicate, but the centrioles did. So you now have still two centrioles. So between meiosis one and meiosis two, centrioles get replicated, DNA does not. Right? But like in any prophase, chromosomes start to condense, nuclear envelope goes away, centrioles move to opposite poles of the cell. At the end of prophase two, the chromosomes are as condensed as they can be, the centrioles are on the opposite side of the cell, the mitotic spindle, now the meiotic spindle, is fully deployed and fully developed. All the chromosomes line up on a metaphase plate Okay. And now, the sister chromatids come apart. They would have come apart like this in anaphase of mitosis, just as a matter of course. But again, one of the differences between meiosis and mitosis is that in anaphase one of meiosis, the sister chromatids remained attached. So it's here in anaphase two of meiosis that the sister chromatids come apart. The centromeres lose their, their grip on them. The chromosomes begin to become less compact. The nuclear envelope starts to form. The, my the meiotic spindle shortens and pulls the sister chromatids to the opposite sides of the cell. When that has played out about as much as it can play out, the mitotic, or here the meiotic spindle, is gone. A nuclear envelope starts to reform. The chromosomes are getting spindly and elongated and tangled up with each other again. You have another round of cytokinesis, so another cleavage furrow that separates those two nuclei. And I don't think the next figure shows it. Maybe it does. I might be surprised. But you end up with one, two, three, four cells. Started with one tetraploid cell, you end with four haploid cells. Those haploid cells, fancy word for them, we call them gametes. Okay? So there they are ready to go and interact with other haploid cells to give rise to a new diploid cell. So once again, I see a pattern here, we get the zoomed in version. Oh here, there's synaptomimal complex. I told you I'd show you how to spell it. So that's what's up with meiosis one and meiosis two. Why bother, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. What's the point? It's, you know, I'll tell you what. 
in some ways of looking at it, it is kind of complicated. It's certainly more complicated than what happened in mitosis. Why would you bother, if you're an organism, maintaining the machinery that's necessary to do this cumbersome thing called meiosis? Well, here's part of the reason why. You know, we're getting to it. There's some real tangible advantages to having sex. From a genetics perspective, there's some really big advantages. But think of some of the alternatives. If you didn't go through this process of reducing haploid number, what if we took some of your cells and smushed them together with somebody else's cells and tried to have you make another generation that way? Well, that's probably not going to work. It might work in the short term, but it's not going to work three, four, five generations down the line. You've got 46 copies of your chromosomes in each of your cells. 46 chromosomes in each of your cells. You're diploid. That kid that you and your friend made by smushing together your cells, and I hope you're friends, at least be friends, right? When you smush together your cells with somebody else's cells, that new organism is going to start out not with 46 chromosomes, but with 92, right? And let's say that works out for some reason. You and your friend managed to make something that's viable that has 96 or 92 chromosomes in it. What's that kid going to do when it's time, when they want to follow in your footsteps and smush together their cells with somebody else's cells, right? Do they have to go along and find somebody else who's got 92 cells so that they can end up smushing together, making 184 cell organisms? Or do they have to find two 46 cell organisms and smush them with theirs, get a triple smushing? I don't know how that works. So it quickly becomes unmanageable. How do you keep this chromosome number from exponentially growing and skyrocketing? That's not a particularly stable strategy for maintaining your genetic material. So that's one of the reasons we need to go through this business of meiosis. Its primary purpose is to reduce the ploidy number, to take us from diploid down to haploid so that you don't have this runaway escalation in terms of the numbers of chromosomes. Now we're chuckling about the idea of smushing together our cells to make a tetraploid human being that in turn then could make an octoploid human being and so forth. It turns out that over the course of evolution, many organisms, and it seems like this is a particularly common strategy among plants, do evolve simply by increasing their ploidy number. Did you know that cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower are related to each other? They're actually very close relatives from an evolutionary perspective. Not quite the same species. Broccoli and cauliflower are relatively new compared to cabbage, but broccoli is tetraploid cabbage. So what happened is some cabbage plants not too long ago smushed their cells together, their diploid cells together, and gave rise to broccoli and also gave rise to cauliflower, two separate events. So broccoli and cauliflower can be described in some sense as tetraploid cabbage. How about that? So that sort of thing seems to happen fairly frequently in plants. In a little while, about three weeks, I think, I'm going to start talking with you about junk DNA, and I'll remind you about how if cabbage has junk DNA, broccoli and cauliflower have twice as much. One of the ways you get junk DNA is from those sorts of ploidy manipulations to give rise to some new species. So why do you go through all this trouble? And remember, you know, as human beings, we take the course of least resistance. We do the things that are easiest, that's most comfortable. Why is nobody doing jumping jacks right now? Because jumping jacks take some work. Nobody wants to do jumping jacks if you don't have to. You're sitting there, you're relaxed, you're comfortable, you're having a good time, or at least you're relaxed and comfortable. And so you're not going to do stuff that you don't have to do. There's no point. Why would you do it? Nature does that a whole lot more fastidiously than we do. Some of you are 
fidgeting, right, or checking your email or something. You know, you're doing nature doesn't do anything unless it really gets a benefit from it. It's so much easier. It's so much more advantageous for nature to let complicated things fall by the wayside. If you're a fish and for the last 50 generations you've been living in a cave where there's no light, you know what happens to those fish's eyeballs? They become blind cave fish, right? You don't maintain complicated things. Nature does not maintain complicated things in an organism unless there is an advantage. And the more complicated the thing, the more advantageous it needs to be in order for nature to be able to have natural selection keep that in play. So this is cumbersome stuff. The synaptonemal complex, all this stuff going on with meiosis. Why do you do it? You do it primarily, I think, to reduce chromosome number, to reduce ploidy number, to get you from diploid down to haploid. But if you didn't do it for that, I think nature could have made a good argument for the advantages you get from having sex from a genetics perspective, from the ability to swap genetic information from one chromosome to another through that crossing over stuff. We're getting there. We're going to talk about that in some detail in the next couple of slides. But before I do, let me just tell you why it is that sort of thing might be really helpful to have. Give you a, uh, an analogy, a, a mental picture as to why, why, why does it matter if mom's chromosome one has gene one and gene two and gene three. Why can't I just be happy with mom's gene one, gene two, and gene three and leave those alone and dad's chromosome one with gene one, gene two, and gene three. Why do I have to swap mom's gene one with dad's gene one once in a while? What advantage could that give me? How about this? Let's say gene one on chromosome one, my mom, let's say my mom had on, for her gene one on chromosome one was something like the ability to have a six foot vertical leap, right? Good job, mom, right? Dad has the more normal six inch vertical leap gene. Right? But mom, man, she's knocking it out of the park with her six foot vertical leap. And let's say gene two on mom's chromosome one is the six foot ten gene, right? And dad's gene two on chromosome one is the, you know, respectable five ten, you know, height gene, right? And let's say, what do you suppose gene three will do? Let's have it be the dribble gene. Right? The, the, the ability to dribble or not dribble gene. Let's say mom got a, a clinker and she's got the cannot dribble version of gene three and dad had the dribbling ability gene for his three. Right? All of those together maybe average out and I'm a fairly good basketball player. But what if I could get rid of mom's clinker dribbling gene and swap it out for dad's good dribbling gene, and now I've got a single chromosome that's the whole package. I am going to be the, you know, Michael Jordan of the next generation times 10, you know, with my, what was it, a six foot vertical leap? I mean, I'm huge. I mean, nobody can stop me. I'll just jump over all the other people as, I go, as I'm doing my spectacular dip, dribbling for my dad's gene. I got an awesome chromosome one. Now, realize that what happened is I swapped dad's good dribbling gene for mom's bad dribbling gene. I got one super chromosome one, and I got one, you feel sorry for the kid, version of chromosome one at the same time. There's a loser in this recombination that's taking place, right? If somebody gets that loser chromosome, natural selection isn't going to let them become an NBA superstar. They're not going to be having sex with 10,000 women, as certain NBA athletes have professed to have done. Um, and we're not going to see that one persist very long in the gene pool. Right? It's just no real advantage to that. Whereas the superstar chromosome, that kid, you know, they can do whatever they like. Their kids are going to be well supported. They go to the best schools, all the rest. Right? So there's some winners and losers.
but that's a neat thing that can only happen as a result of prophase one in meiosis. If you don't have that swapping of the chromosomes, what you're going to get is you're going to get the ability to make some, some combinations of, of individuals that are okay, but boy, you can get much more extreme examples. You can, you can spread out that bell-shaped curve an awful lot more with recombination than you could without that recombination. And again, when you spread out that bell-shaped curve, the further you go to one direction, the further you have to go in the other direction, you get some real clinkers, right? We can feel bad for them, <laughs> but we don't see them very much. The good news is, is that all of us, we must have been on the other side of the bell-shaped curve, right? We're the, we're the winners because we're still here. All the clinkers are gone. We're the winners. And now, natural selection is spreading out our bell-shaped curve. We're going to be weeding out some of the, the less fit amongst us. You get a much better spread because of meiosis than you would have had if you didn't have meiosis. So here I've been talking with you already in some detail now about the advantages of sex. Let's get to work just a little bit here and see what's actually happening with the business of, of crossing over. So here, here's what happens if you don't let crossing over happen, right? So you could do meiosis and get the job done of, of reducing ploidy number without crossing over. So, so here's what happens if you do that without crossing over. Even without crossing over, meiosis does some good stuff for you because I put all of those basketball genes right next to each other on, on one chromosome. Let's say that instead of being on one chromosome, they were on two chromosomes. Okay? Chromosome one has the vertical leap in the height. Chromosome two has dribbling. If these are in separate chunks of DNA, because of the independent assortment that happens, during meiosis, you might find yourself in a circumstance where you get gametes that have red chromosomes mixed with blue chromosomes, or you might end up with gametes that have just blue chromosomes and just red chromosomes. All right? So you could have gametes that look like this. If the dribbling gene is on that little red one and the vertical leap in the height gene or on the blue one, these guys may be winners, this is going to be a super loser, and these are going to be kind of middle of the road kind of guys. All right? So meiosis, sexual reproduction, when you have multiple chromosomes by itself can help you quite a bit. But you take it to a whole nother level when you let these chiasma kick in and break up the linkages of between genes on single chromosomes that would otherwise have to go together because they're literally physically connected to each other. Covalent bonds are holding those genes together. Those covalent bonds can get broken up during chiasma or crossing over. Okay? And you end up then with gametes that have some chromosomes that are a little bit blue and a little bit red. So we can reassort, we can mix things up a little bit through the process of crossing over. One more time, that chiasma is being mediated by a complex, a pretty complicated set of proteins called the synaptonemal complex. It takes quite a while to assemble those proteins. It takes a little while to break them up and get them out of the way. Uh, that's why prophase one in meiosis, specifically meiosis one, takes a little bit of time. One other thing, I said it before, so two other things. One other thing, um, the locations where these chiasma occur are random. Right? So from one meiosis to the next, from one prophase one to the next, you can't predict where it is along the length of the homologous chromosomes that chiasma will form. 
It's a crapshoot. The further apart the two genes are, the more likely that a chiasma will form between them, that a crossing over event will occur between them. But where along the length of a chromosome, there's no predicting. It's an entirely random process. So that's one thing, and I've already told you that. Here's another little tidbit for you. For human beings, and I believe it's true for all other eukaryotes as well, I'm more of a human geneticist than I am a fruit fly geneticist, but I think it happens for fruit flies too. Every chromosome has to, every chromosome that passes through prophase one has to undergo at least one crossing over event. Right? There's no free pass. Every time that our chromosomes go through uh, prophase one, there's an obligatory instance of at least one crossing over event. You could have 10, that's okay, but you have to have one. You can't have zero. So we're locked into this idea of mixing up our chromosomes and breaking up the linkages between our different genes. All right, so here's a fairly simple overview of what's going on. Uh, prophase one, the uh, homologous chromosomes undergo synaps synapsis. Synapsis is just the lining up of the equivalent bits of the chromosomes, so gene one next to gene one, gene two next to gene two. And then crossing over occurs. Again, prophase one takes a while. Metaphase one, the chromosomes line up just as they do during metaphase in mitosis on the metaphase plate. Anaphase one, the chromosomes separate from each other. The nuclear envelope starts to reform. A difference from mitosis is the sister chromatids are still, still stuck together at their centromeres. Um, Probably another slide that I just didn't bother to copy over that shows you what happens with the next round for meiosis two, the second half of it. Where are we? Well, let me tell you. You end up with stuff like this. I, I'll tell you, frankly, this is just gratuitous on my part. I don't know that it applies directly to what it is I've been talking with you about, but that's a darn pretty picture. That's a uh, fancy word for it is that this is called a karyotype. Right? It's the complete, it's a photograph, it's a snapshot of some human being's complete set of chromosomes. Okay? There are people who make their living doing nothing but generating these pictures. They're called cytogeneticists. They often work closely with or also moonlight as genetic counselors. I've gotten to know some cytogeneticists you know, years ago during my own postdoctoral studies when I was pulling the heads off of fruit, baby fruit flies and looking at their chromosomes, the stuff that a cytogeneticist can do, it's, it, they're really well trained at pattern recognition, that's their primary skill, but the stuff they can do by recognizing patterns is amazing. They can look at a karyotype like this and they can say, oh, geez, you know, this kid's gonna have some issues. He's probably gonna have a heart valve defect, bedwetting, and maybe, you know, a club foot, right? You know, it's like, whoa, what, 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 what? How did you come up with that? Where did that come from? And they'll do stuff like say, ah, well, here, look at chromosome eight. You see how you've got that little bit of extra yellow there? Uh, that, you know, we've seen that before. When you see that little bit of extra yellow, that means there's been a duplication in this region of the chromosome and there are problems. People have looked, cytogeneticists have looked at so many different karyotypes, you know, millions of karyotypes over the last hundred some years. They've looked at so many that pretty much anything that's genetically wrong with somebody, they can point to over here. And if they see somebody else with the same pattern, they can tell you, yeah, this kid's gonna have some issues. And so this is why people do amniocentesis if they think there's a, a concern or a risk, if there's a family history of something or other. These, this look at a very high level of the complete set of chromosomes can often give rise to uh, insights in terms of what's going on. You know, here, let me try to make this relevant to what I've been talking with you about. I told you there are 22 different pairs of chromosomes and then the sex chromosomes. You know, let's just take a guided tour. This is sort of like the NOVA part of uh, today's lecture. 
I told you the chromosomes are named on the basis of their size, right? Did you think I made that up? I didn't make that up. Look, there's the picture. This is straight out of some book somewhere, your book, that tells you, look, the biggest chromosome, anybody want to quibble with me? Is there a chromosome that's bigger than this one here? No, that's the biggest chromosome. Look what its name is. That's chromosome one. That's not just chromosome one. That's human chromosome one, right? What's the next biggest chromosome? Hey, check that out. Name? Yeah, of course, it's two. I'm not lying to you about this stuff. Uh, what's the smallest, pipsqueakiest one around here? Oh, yeah, that's pretty tiny. Look at that, chromosome 22, right? 22 different pairs of chromosomes plus the sex chromosomes. And I think this is one that's, uh, you know, do I, it, it sort of speaks for itself, right? We have a pair of sex chromosomes. There's an X chromosome and there's a Y chromosome. <clears throat> Do you need a biology professor to tell you that men and women are different? They are, right? At a genetic level, women have two X's, men have an X and a Y. And I can see the looks on so many of the women's faces in here today. You're smug. You guys are all real smug because you're looking at this and you're thinking, you got these two big, beautiful X's, and all these guys have is one of those little tiny space holders. Uh, it's called a Y chromosome. So, you know, take pity on us, ladies, because we're working with a much smaller deck th than you are. <laughs> um, the reality is, is the difference in the size in those two chromosomes does indeed correspond to differences in the number of genes, right? The X chromosome has a boatload of genes on it. The Y chromosome, eh, you know, if there's three or four, only one of them makes any difference. It's the one that's is responsible for turning on the things that make testosterone and do all the rest of the stuff. But there's like one switch, and there's a couple others that are just tagging along for a ride. Y chromosome, not much happening. X chromosome, awful lot of genes. Okay? So there you go. There's a karyotype. And look where we're at. Now don't get excited, right? Because here's what I want to do. I'm going to give you this question on the exam you see on Thursday. Right, so you can jot it down, take a picture if you like. I'm going to talk for a few seconds here. But we still got 20 minutes where we're supposed to be hanging out today. Right? And what I want to do is use those 20 minutes today to start talking about some of the implications of what I've talked about in terms of meiosis, in terms of now translating it directly to genetics. And if I can do that, if you'll indulge me for another 10, 15 minutes today, that's going to be the 10, 15 minutes that on Tuesday we can use to be a review, a review session. All right? So don't leave just now. Well, you can leave anytime you like. What, how am I even going to notice if anybody leaves a room this size? So if you want to leave, go ahead. That's, that's the end of this lecture. But I want to forge ahead and jump into the next lecture outline so that we can finish a little bit ahead of schedule on Tuesday, and then with that extra time on Tuesday, use that to have a review session. So may I move to the next slide? Any objections? Mr. Chance. So, <laughs> uh, so let's talk specifically now about genetics the study of how it is that traits get transmitted from one generation to another. The lecture outline that I have for Tuesday's lecture is that, right? but we're launching into it right now today. And when we're going to talk about genetics, it always has to start with an homage to uh, the founder of the field, more or less, uh, Gregor Mendel, an old Austrian monk. Uh, it wasn't that long ago, just a little over 100, 150 years ago, that Gregor Mendel figured out what became the basis and has become the basis for all of our understanding of genetics. So let's get to work and talk a little bit about Mendelian genetics. And let me introduce you to this Mendel guy. Uh, so Gregor Mendel, a monk, right? Picture it. Just a monk, right? Monks are pretty humble folk, right? As a rule, uh, no ostentation, no fancy cars, right? Monks are, you know, salt of the earth kind of people. Gregor Mendel, because of that sort of humility, 
had a real advantage in figuring out, getting some keen insights into genetics that people for thousands of years before him failed to deliver on, right? Plato and Aristotle, and surely before them, but they're some of the first people who actually wrote these things down, speculated about why it is that like begets like, why it is that if your dad's got a big nose, there's a pretty good chance you've got a big nose too. I'm not looking at anybody in particular, right? But, you know, why is it that things that our parents, features that our parents have are likely to be things that we have? Why is it that if you take two sisters and you put them side by side, like, oh yeah, okay, I get it, you're, you're related, right? What's up with that, right? There have been crazy ideas that people have been laboring with uh, for thousands of years, right? The idea that inside of every sperm and every egg there was a little tiny miniature version, perfect in every way, copy of ourselves, that when they got smushed together, they kind of blended and fused and you got the average, right? That was a prevailing theory back for thousands of years, Plato and Aristotle, they called them simulcrons, just little tiny versions of yourself that would blend and average together when an egg got fertilized. That was a prevailing theory. The problem that people trying to figure out inheritance had up until Mendel is they were trying to figure it out for organisms that frankly people care about, <clears throat> particularly human beings. As a genetic organism, there's a technical term for it, we suck, right? We, we're, we, we almost define, if you talk about what are the characteristics, the features that make <clears throat> an organism a good genetic organism, I'll go through a list for you. We are like the definition of the bad thing for those features, right? Mendel said, gee, you know, Plato, Aristotle, brilliant, amazing, great deep thinkers, man, you know, I'll never be able to do anything as good as they could have. I'm just going to see if I can't figure out. These are beautiful little plants, right? These pea plants that he has in his garden, they're beautiful. He's contemplating nature, thinking about God, looking at the pretty flowers. And he says, I just want to understand how it is that these guys, these simple, trivial things, are able to pass their genes on. And he stumbled upon, with his study of pea plants, a model genetic organism that's pretty darn good compared to other things like humans or horses or cows or dogs, right? Those are not particularly good model genetic organisms. Mendel instead studies pea plants. Here are some of the things that make pea plants a really good genetic organism, right? I'll give you a list. Short generation times, right? He could conduct a mating experiment, and that's what genetics is all about, by the way, folks. It's all about sex. It's all about how the genes get moved from one generation to the next. You can't get genes from one generation to the next in eukaryotes without sex. So there's got to be mating for genetics to work. Generation time in pea plants are relatively short. He could get five or six crops of pea plants per growing season. Each year, he could do five or six generations of pea plants. He could think, gee, I wonder what happens if I mate a purple flowering plant with a white flowering plant. What, what would I see, right? He'd get the results in a couple of weeks. What if instead he was asking questions, gee, I wonder what would happen if I made it a blonde with a brunette? Oh, what's going to happen? He's going to at the least be waiting nine months for that, right? At the very least, right? So short generation time, huge advantage for a model genetic organism. Pea plants, pretty good compared to anything else that you guys might be thinking about people in particular. How about this? Number of progeny, right? Each mating experiment he did with his pea plants, he'd get dozens of seeds that could give rise to pea plants that he could check out. Right? Human beings, on average, uh, one. <laughs> one per mating experiment. Right? So short generation time, large number of progeny, long generation time, small number of progeny. Oh, man, he 
humans just aren't stacking up too well compared to peat plants. How about, you know, this is a fairly trivial one, but how about upkeep, right? You know how much it takes for him to maintain his garden? Uh, not much, <laughs> right? He, he's got to dig the dirt up once in a while. He's got to put water on it once in a while. Oh my gosh, wait till you guys have kids that you're thinking about sending to college, right? I mean, <laughs> just to get there. Whoa, I mean, the current estimates are it's like a quarter million dollars per kid to get them to the point where they're ready to go to college. Whoa, right? So upkeep, peat plants are a big winner. Here's one, probably is important for a, a, a monk to think about this, but what about the ethical considerations, right? None of you batted an eye when I suggested that we might want to have a blonde and a brunette have sex to see what kind of kids they Can you imagine me getting permission to do that here at Wright State? I can't, no, <laughs> that's not gonna happen. Okay, you too, yeah, no, that's not gonna work. Right? <laughs> Nobody bats an eye when you take a little pollen from one pea plant and you brush it onto another pea plant. Nobody minds about that at all. For goodness sakes, I think some of you have heard, we can't even use goldfish in the freshman biology labs for you guys to study their metabolic rates with. The experiment you did two weeks ago where you had crayfish and snails, that was originally designed by me with goldfish, but then the animal rights people got concerned about our abuse of vertebrates and so we had to switch to a non-vertebrate, the crayfish. So that's the, we can't even use goldfish. How am I ever going to be able to get permission or you know, buy into the idea? I just want to see what happens when you two mix your genes together. It's just not going to happen. It just doesn't work. So pea plants. Oh, and then there's one other thing that was a neat thing that Mendel had going for him is there wasn't that much difference from one pea plant to another pea plant, but he could go down the street from his monastery, and I'm not joking, he literally would walk down the street from his monastery to a farm supply store and buy peas that he could plant in his garden. And the peas were in different bins. He could get peas that had purple flowers versus white flowers. The people there were selling purple flowering pea plants versus white flowering pea plants. He could buy wrinkled peas or smooth peas. How about that, right? So they had like eight different kinds of peas that he could choose from. There were some well-developed, characterized traits that were ready for him to use. For humans, geez, I don't know how, what the equivalent would be. Hair color maybe, eye color. Height, I don't know. It's just there's such a continuum of traits within humans that does that didn't work nearly so well as what Mendel was able to do with his pea plants. Alright? So Mendel by pres by presuming that he couldn't possibly figure out what was going on with a phenomenally complicated, wonderful organism like a human being and instead focusing his attention on something very humble and innocuous, hit a home run. And the insights that he ended up getting from figuring out how pea plants passed their genes on from one generation to the next ended up cracking the nut and explaining how it works for everything else as well. So it was his choice of a model organism that ended up being what really put Mendel on the map. If he had decided to study chihuahuas instead of pea plants, this would be a phenomenally different lecture. And <laughs> we probably would be uh, in a very different uh, sort of world than we are right now. So Mendel, instead, he works with these pea plants. It was easy for him, you know, pea plants are simultaneously male and female. They have the capacity to make both ovum and pollen, so they can make the equivalent of eggs and sperm. But Mendel, and again, doesn't go over well in human circles, but uh, with pea plants, nobody mind when he would cut off the pollen producing things, right? And then he would take pollen from one thing and put it on the ovum of the other. So he had to do forced mating experiments, essentially. Uh, scissors to get rid of the stuff that makes the pollen, paint brushes to move pollen from one thing to the egg area of the other flower, and then baby peas would result. Um, and there's some jargon 
that I'll get out of the way today so that we can hit the ground running on <clears throat> Tuesday of next week. So he would do mating experiments. And I, I've said it before, I'll keep emphasizing it, you can't do genetics. Genetics is all about how it is that traits are being transmitted from one generation to another. You can't do genetics without mating experiments. Uh, the result of his mating experiments after, in, in, so the mating itself would be a cross, right? so the result of a cross of a mating experiment would be some progeny. The progeny, get a fancy name, he called them the first filial generation. You've all heard, I'm sure, that Philadelphia was Ben Franklin's clever idea. He came up with the name for Philadelphia. He wanted it to be known as the city of brotherly love, Phila, filial brother, right? So this is the first filial generation, the first set of progeny that came out. And by shorthand, after that first mating experiment, the next generation is called the F1 generation. It's the first filial generation. And what would happen is he would do things like this. He'd take true breeding, purple flowering plants and white flowering plants. Those are the P generation, not because they're P plants, but because it's the parental generation. And I've said true breeding, what that means in simple terms is that if he let the purple flowering plants breed amongst themselves, the only kind of baby pea plants that he would ever see would be purple flowering. And if he took the white flowering pea plants and let them breed amongst themselves, the only kind of baby pea plants he would ever see would be white flowering pea plants. So he took true breeding, purple flowering and white flowering pea plants for his pea generation. He would cross them and look to see what sort of thing he found in the F1 generation, first generation after that mating experiment. <laughs> and what he found made him scratch his head a little bit. And this is the very first mating experiment that Mendel did. The purple flowering and white flowering peas gave rise only to purple flowering babies. Right? The F1 generation was only white flowering. And so he's scratching his head. You know, Plato and Aristotle were thinking that you'd get some sort of intermediate color, pale pink or pale purple, something like that, right? But that's not what happens. He gets only purple flowering plants. And so it's a bit of a head scratcher. And you gotta wonder what it is that motivated him to do the next experiment. Because I think an awful lot of people probably would have stopped right there and said, hmm, well, that's a bust. Right? I thought maybe I'd see some intermediate traits, something like that. Maybe I'd see some purple, maybe I'd see some white. Purple, what's up with that? The, the what's up with that in Mendel translated to, oh, I gotta see what's going on. I think a lot of people would have given up. He took these F1 plants and he mated them amongst themselves. Another interesting ethical dilemma for human geneticists, by the way, right? <laughs> brothers and sisters, you know, again, it's hard to get permission from a university to be able to do those types of experiments. It's not hard. It's impossible to get that kind of permission. But when you're working with pea plants, uh, those rules don't apply. So he crossed these guys with each other, and whoa, the white came back, right? And the, the way that the white came back was another head scratcher for him. In the F2 generation, the second filial generation, which means, again, in simple terms, he took the brothers and sisters from the F1 generation and mated them incestuously amongst themselves to get the F2 generation. In his F2 generation, he gets purple and white flowering pea plants, but always in the ratio of three to one, three times as many purples as whites. Another head scratcher. Nobody had ever seen stuff like this before. Mendel is observing this for the very first time. And like, what is up with that? One of the things that he sees from this right out of the gate is that the white, whatever it is that gave rise to the white flower, 
was preserved in some way in these purple flowers, even though you couldn't see any evidence of it in the purple flowers. It was preserved and it came out unchanged, unmodified, unblended. He felt that it looked like there was some sort of particle that must be involved. And so he started to talk about particulate inheritance, the particle that made the first, the, in the pea generation, the white flowering pea plant, white flowering, that particle was transmitted faithfully to the F1 generation, even though you couldn't see it, even though there was no indication of it, and it was a faithfully transmitted again to the F2 generation. So it passed through that F1 generation unsullied, unchanged in any way, and he ends up, and again, check out the, the, the value of N in the sense of the number of uh, progeny he's looking at, 705 versus 224. Remember, again, one of the things that makes pea plants a really good model genetic organism, at least relative to human beings, is the number of progeny that you can do. Those, you get some serious statistical power that you can attach to these types of analyses. If he had seen two blondes and one brunette, uh, I don't know, what is that? Right. But no, he sees hundreds of purples and hundreds of whites. So it's at this point that Mendel has a pretty good idea that particulate inheritance is involved. And it was also at this point, looking at those numbers, making sense of the three to one ratio, they started to get the idea, the, the beginnings of the idea of diploid. Nobody had ever considered ploidy before Mendel. Mendel started to get the idea, maybe there are two particles. Maybe it's not just that the particles get transmitted faithfully. Maybe it's that there are two particles in every organism. One of them may have more of a say about what things look like than the other, dominant versus recessive, here purple, dominant to white. And then he's able to do some additional experiments on these F2 guys, making F3 generations, but let him test some hypotheses. I mentioned that in the P, in the farmer supply store down the street from his monastery, there were a number of different varieties that he could get. Here they are. These are the ones that he had to work with that are in his notebooks that he had done some experiments on. Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven different traits, each determined, we now know, by a single gene. Right? So we have traits um, that are determined by a single gene, ends up being a beautiful model system. Those are the actual numbers that Mendel recorded in his notebooks. Uh, these are all what are called monohybrid crosses. So he's only keeping track of what's going on for one particular trait, flower color, flower position, seed color, right? He started his work doing nothing but monohybrid crosses. But once he figured out what was going on with these monohybrid crosses, he began doing what are called dihybrid crosses where he would look at how two things would be passing from one generation to another, flower color and seed color. He found some interesting surprises along the way there too. So what I want to do is on Tuesday is pick up pretty much right here, and I'm going to start showing you things like Punnett squares, which Mendel had actually pretty well worked out when he's thinking about his particles. And we'll finish a little bit early on Tuesday so I can do a quick review session for you. That's it for today. Have a great weekend. Look at some of those old exams. Get ready for Thursday's test. See you guys Tuesday. When you were talking about the